Now we do know that the captain radioed an SOS, but shortly after that, he left the bridge. He went down to the pool deck, got a cigarette, smoked it, and basically sat there. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to another video, and in today's video, we are back with recreating the disasters. Today, we're going to be focusing on the MTS Oceanos. So yeah guys, let's get into the video. Now here we have the ship, it's moored up in Cape Town, South Africa, and it actually wasn't originally launched as Oceanos. So I'm going to hand it over to Jake Hillen to talk about it. So yeah, the ship actually went through several different lines and designs throughout the decades. It was originally built as the Jean Laborde in 1952 under the French Misaudrian Maritime, and it was eventually sold in 1970 to the Helite Hellenic Lines as the Makina and then the Ancona, and then it was sold in 1974 to the CS Ephematis Lines known as the Eastern Princess, and then it was sold in 1976 to Epertiki Lines and it was called the Oceanos. And in 1982, it was sold to the Laura Lines under the name of the Ocean Nuz. And then it was sold for the last time in 1983 to Epertiki Lines again as the Oceanos. So yeah, the ship went through a lot of owners, a lot of name changes, and actually received quite a few superstructure updates. Now, the model in this game is quite old now, and unfortunately, it is not super realistic, but it does get the general shape right. Now, the date is July 31st, 1991, and the Oceanos is about to depart from Cape Town. Now, my friend and Oceanos survivor Rose actually took a couple of photos while the ship was leaving port, and the weather was quite similar to how it is in-game, which is really fitting. So, uh, yeah, we're gonna start setting sail here, and, uh, we're gonna make our way out to sea. Now, we are currently making our way to East London, South Africa, and we'll get to that in a minute. Now, unfortunately, East London isn't represented in the game, so we're just gonna find a nearby island and just pretend that that's East London. And there's a cargo ship there, which will come into play a little bit later as well. Now, two weeks prior to this actual voyage, the Oceanos actually ran aground. This was when it was leaving Reunion Harbor, and we're not exactly sure why it ran aground, but we do have video of it. And I've got to thank Moss Hills for providing this video, but you can actually hear the Oceanos running aground. You can hear the grinding noises as the ship bumps up against rocks and the seabed. So I'll play that for a second so you can actually hear what the ship sounded like when it ran aground. So yeah, there it was. You could hear it there for yourself. The noise that it made was quite frightening. I mean, if I was on a ship like that and I heard those noises and they were echoing throughout the ship, I would definitely be concerned. Now, the ship sailed on fine, but what wasn't fine is a small seam that had opened up from the actual grounding. Now, this was not a situation like Costa Concordia where it ripped open a huge gash along the side. This is something that just basically jarred loose some shell plating. It opened up a seam, but that seam would get much worse in the storm ahead. Now, not this particular sailing, but the sailing after they left East London Harbor. So, uh, yeah, we'll get into that momentarily. Now, the Oceanus was a very old cruise ship at this stage, and it really wasn't supposed to be a cruise ship. It was supposed to be a mixed passenger and cargo vessel. But because the cruise market exploded and became so popular, a lot of these ocean liners were converted into cruise ships, like SS America. And as a result of this, the amenities on board weren't super great. For example, there were three bars, there was a casino, a disco, there were two lounges, and a dining room. So there you go, and we are about to be attacked by the Seawise Giant there, so congrats, you missed. Anyways, as you can see, the Oceanos is now docking up in our fictional East London. Really, it's Tokyo in game, but uh, it should work. All right, so here we are. We have docked up in East London, and the passengers would get off for two days, and the next day, they actually wouldn't be back on board. There would be a wedding on board, and holy cow, that yacht just freaked out there. But yeah, there would be a wedding on board. There would be news photographers there. It would be a whole party. The ship would sail out to sea, come back, and then the passengers would reboard the next day and they would leave for Durban. 
Now, interestingly enough, the storm that was coming in got so bad that some of the passengers just refused to reboard the ship because it was not good. While the buses were bringing some of the passengers back to the ship, there was a building that had its roof torn right off right in front of them. So you could see how they wouldn't want to get back on board in these weather conditions. And again, thank you to Rose for sharing some of these photos with me. You can see, here's the coastline here. You can see this is a photo that they took while, well, making their way back towards the ship. Now, while we're waiting for the time to change so we can leave port, we're gonna talk about what's going on down below in the generator room. Now, to get an idea of where the generator room is, it's basically right below the funnel, and it basically houses all the generators, as you would imagine. And they power a lot of things on board, like lighting, plumbing, etc. So if they went out, that would be bad. Now, just in front of that generator room was a converted cargo hold, which was now a sewage tank. So that sewage tank was getting clogged up very repeatedly because there were a lot of passengers on board and the plumbing system on board wasn't super great. And that tank happened to get overfilled quite a bit with basically just waste. And what happened was, is as the waste filled up, it blocked up the sewage ventilation pipe. And you've got to have a sewage ventilation pipe. If you don't, it's going to basically make your toilet stink every time you flush it because the air is going to come up through the pipes and it's just going to be bad. And unfortunately, that was the case. So on the voyage that we just took, people were complaining about a smell like sewage around the ship whenever they would use the bathroom or something like that. So they had to go down, open up that ventilation pipe, see what was down there, clear it off, and then put the pipe back in. Now, they would only start working on this just before the ship left port. Now, you can kind of see where the problem is going to develop here. Now, you've got this damaged piece of hull, which happens to be right behind a sea chest, which is basically an inlet valve that takes water in and circulates it around the generators or the engines to cool them down. Because you don't want those to overheat because then you're going to lose a lot of critical systems. So. You've got that going on, and now, in the same room, you've got a sewage ventilation pipe, which leads directly into the sewage tank, which leads into every bathroom and shower in the ship, just exposed. So now there's a path for water to get through, and it just needs that breach for water to get into the generator room and cause all of this flooding to occur. Now at the time, the Oceanus was actually being chartered by TFC Cruises, so it was being operated with staff from the Upper Tiki Line, but also being chartered by TFC Cruises. Now TFC Cruises was a very popular charter line or cruise line in the 1990s, 1980s as well, and the Oceanus was among one of its favorite ships that they used to charter. Now, they were selling these tickets for this particular overnight cruise for super cheap. So a lot of people were just going to have a one overnight cruise. They would drive down to East London or fly down to East London or be living in East London, get on the ship, and then go all the way back to Durban or go to Durban and then get a plane back to East London or whatever. So that was the premise, and a lot of people took the opportunity because it was cheap, it would be fun, a nice little overnight party, and that would be it. Now, for some passengers, they went from Durban to Cape Town, and then they were on this voyage from Cape Town all the way back up to Durban, and they were just hoping that they were going to get home, everything was going to be good, and Rose, one of the people who shared the images with us, the real photos, was one of those passengers that went from Durban to Cape Town, and then back from Cape Town to Durban. Obviously, the ship didn't make it to Durban, because you'll find out. So the ship is now leaving in this pretty bad storm. There is a photo of the ship leaving port and I'll show it here. That is the last photo of it from shore, I think. I think there was a couple that are from the land when the ship was going down, but I'm not sure if those are public. I've heard of people taking photos, but I haven't actually seen them. So if one day those come into existence, that'll be cool to see. So yeah. Anyways, the ship is now sailing away from the dock there. Now, the ship actually sailed out a little bit later. The captain kept pushing back the sail-out time because the weather was just getting really, really bad. But maybe he was being pressured to get to Durban on time or get to Durban by the next day. He didn't want to delay it any further. So he just said, go ahead, go with it. 
And he did. He went with it and he just sailed out. And that would be a mistake. So as the ship sails out, there is a party inside the lounge because they're not going to have one on the pool deck like normal. The weather's just way too bad for that. And things are sliding around. Robin Boltman recalled to me that he remembers seeing the piano sliding off the uh, stage, crashing onto the floor, almost hitting a couple people. And that's when they said, you know what, let's stop this party. We're just going to lay low for a little bit. People were in the dining room. This photo again by Rose shows the dining room moments before the power went out and we'll get to that in a moment but it's super eerie to see these photos right before disaster so yeah now we're sailing through an ice field which is not really accurate but we're just gonna sail around this and just ignore it now the waves get to a point where they start damaging the hull and the sea chest which is now exposed because of the grounding blows off the inside of the hull at that moment, the generator room starts taking on massive amounts of water. The crew members quickly escape, but it's not enough time to put that pipe back to the sewage tank. And unfortunately, the water would fill up the generator room and then pour into the sewage ventilation pipe, into the sewage tank, and up into the cabins. Now, the chief engineer who was actually in that room quickly realizes the problem and shuts off the generators. This causes the ship to go into a blackout. The engines won't work, nothing's working, the lights are out, and it would be some time until the emergency lights came on. At this point, either the chief engineer calls up to the bridge or the captain calls to the generator room and says, what's going on? The chief engineer says, we're sinking. The captain has a hard time understanding that, but eventually then understands and drops anchor. So they have a bunch of crew members go down to the forecastle or the forecastle deck and they drop anchor. Unfortunately, they forget to close the doors. And unfortunately, that would have a consequence later when the ship was in its final moments. So really, no one but the crew really know what's going on. And slowly, word starts to spread through the lower-ranking crew members that something's amiss. Water is quickly entering the vessel. And I recently heard a story where one of the dancers went below and saw the chief engineer and some other Filipino crew members looking for a valve. And they opened a door and you could hear, well, according to the survivor testimony, you could hear the water coming into the ship. With each wave, more water enters into the vessel and is rapidly flooding up through the drains. So you can imagine, you're in your cabin, it's rolling all around, and all of a sudden, water starts flooding up through your sink, through your toilet, through your shower. That's frightening. At this point, the ship is really unstable. It's going down. Lifeboats are getting away, but they're leaving with mostly crew members and also some passengers. Now, we do know that the captain radioed an SOS, but shortly after that, he left the bridge. He went down to the pool deck, got a cigarette, smoked it, and basically sat there. And when Moss Hills went down below, saw the water, went back up to launch boats, and then went to the bridge, realized that the bridge was abandoned, he went to the back of the ship where the captain was, said, what are we going to do? And the captain just told him, there's nothing that can be done. Obviously, there were things that could have been done. Robin Boltman manned the bridge. Now, this is a magician. He's taken a couple bridge tours, but he doesn't know how to man operations, so he's all doing this for the first time. The sun breaks over the horizon, and that's just amazing to see for these passengers. This is their savior. They are now going to be seen. They see all these ships around and will be seeing a ship around very shortly. At this point, Robin Boltman is signaling to shore saying we need helicopters. Helicopters quickly approach and they start basically taking people off the deck of the ship. Now it should also be mentioned that people actually had to jump off the ship into the water by the bow, but that was much earlier when the bow wasn't underwater. It was amazing what this team did. These unqualified crew members or well entertainment staff ran the rescue with the help and aid of some of the Filipino crew members. Some of the Filipino crew members actually helped launch boats. Some of the Greeks helped launch boats as well, but mostly the senior officers had abandoned ship. As you can see, we've got a cargo ship offshore. It's a little bit late, but it took them a little while to get over here. But this is sort of similar to what was seen in real life with the ship going down and you can see the cargo ships over there 
Just super, super eerie to see that. But there she goes, the Oceano sinking to the bottom. And there it is, right there, it's about to go under. And just a moment, it's gonna go. And there it is, slipping under with a cargo ship in the distance. Now, in real life, it would have basically teetered over already, but it's, uh, it's gonna do something interesting here. Actually, will it fall onto its side? Let's hope. That'd be realistic. And yes, it does. Wow, that's actually really realistic. There we go. Well done. There it is. That was recreating the Oceano sinking disaster. Well, it really wasn't a disaster. It was a miracle that everyone survived. So yeah, if you guys have enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like and a comment, and I'll see you next time, guys. Goodbye.